So the Gundry Lecture is an endowed lectureship that honors the work of Rachel K. Gundry. Uh, the lectureship is designed to highlight the work of prominent uh, women psychiatrists who we invite to lecture for our department. And we want to thank the uh, foundation that sponsors the Gundry Lectureship. Um, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Shim, Dr. Ruth Shim who is the Luke and Grace Kim Professor in Cultural Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Associate Dean of Diverse and Inclusive Education at the University of California Davis School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Shim received an MPH in Health Policy from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University and an MD from Emory University School of Medicine. Um, She's a former fellow in, of the Executive Leadership and Academic Medicine Program and a large member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Forum on Mental Health and Substance Use Disorders. Um, and she's also a very active member of the American Association for Community Psychiatry. So I wanna thank Dr. Shim for joining us um, and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Shim. Thank you, Dr. Forrester, for that introduction. I'm really pleased to be joining you all remotely. Um, I believe that the weather here in California is better than the weather that you all are experiencing in Maryland, but, um, but I'm sorry that I'm not able to be there in person with you all. Um, so today we are gonna talk about structural racism in psychiatry. And I know that you all had the pleasure of experiencing a grand rounds earlier from my colleague, um, and friend, Dr. Sarah Vinson, who talked about social injustice and mental health. And these things are very closely related. So, so I'm hoping that this talk will build on um, the presentation that she gave you a few weeks, a few weeks ago. So today we are going to define some key concepts associated with structural racism and mental health. And we're going to evaluate the evidence base of the impact of structural racism on behavioral health outcomes. And finally, we're going to try to identify some solutions to dismantle structural racism in psychiatry. I always have to make a disclaimer before we start talking about these topics. Um, and, and often I, I say I don't really have anything particularly uh, important to disclose, but I have to make this disclaimer because when we talk about the concept of structural racism, um, people have a lot of feelings um, because it is a difficult and uncomfortable topic. So these complex feelings are going to emerge as we talk about these things. Um, those feelings might include guilt, they might include anger, they might be uh, feelings of resentment, there may be feelings of defensiveness, any other number of feelings that I haven't um, really even brought up here. Uh, you may also perceive me of accusing you of being someone who is racist or sexist or homophobic or any number of, um, of, of negative um, connotations uh, that, that you may feel that that's what I'm implying. And you also may feel that I have some sort of specific political agenda that I'm trying to push upon you or that I lack a certain scientific objectivity in trying to talk about these topics. Um, I need to make this disclaimer because I have been um, told uh, that I have been doing all of these things whenever I try to talk about these topics. And so I wanna make sure that um, you all know that none of that is the objective of, of why I'm here talking to you about this today, um, but it is not necessarily uncommon to have feelings like that um, when we talk about these topics. And I would just say, because we are mental health professionals, um, that the idea here is that if you start to notice that you're having these feelings, which are normal feelings, that it might be a good idea to look within um, and do a little bit of self-reflection because that is the type of work that is needed to make progress in this space. And so also I think it's helpful um, to use the wisdom of James Baldwin in trying to think about uh, th this topic and why it's so difficult. Uh, James Baldwin said, I'm not interested in anybody's guilt. Guilt is a luxury that we can no longer afford. I know you didn't do it and I didn't do it either, but I am responsible for it because I am a man and a citizen of this country and you are responsible for it for the very same reason. So why is it so hard to talk about these topics? Um, when we talk about social injustice, when we talk about structural racism, um, it takes on a particularly difficult 
meaning and context here in the United States. It starts out when we are very young because we've been socialized to believe that it is not polite to talk about race or racism or even oppression. And this starts very early on. It starts in uh, childhood um, and when we're young, have these beliefs that beliefs. background noise. Thank you. So when we're very young, we have these beliefs that it is not okay to talk about race and racism and oppression. Um, and so this starts when we're, when we're children um, and it continues as we get older. And so we're socialized in this country to believe that it's not okay to talk about these topics. Um, we, think that you, you, we think that if you're talking about these topics, you're not being um, polite. So in addition to this, health professionals have been taught have not been taught about the connection between oppression and health. Um, and particularly when we think about medical schools um, or we think about places, health professional schools, um, there's a long tradition of teaching concepts of biological determinism or even teaching racist concepts um, in, the, in the name of teaching about medicine. And, and the last thing I wanna say about why it's so difficult to talk about this is we, we experience in the time of COVID um, and in the deaths of George Floyd and others, um, a bit of an awakening um, in this country uh, for many people in which the focus on racism became much more significant than it has been um, for some people in the past. And so in that time, I think that that focus led to certain people feeling like there has been an overemphasis and an overcorrection um, in talking about racism and in talking about structural racism. And that uh, even that belief system of, of this feeling that we've spent too much time now talking about this concept, that also makes it difficult to talk about these issues. And one of the reasons that it's so difficult to talk about race and racism in medicine is because of the complexity of the concept of race. So race is a social and a political construct. And what that means is that it is not something that you can ac accurately biologically categorize. And it's very interesting to me right. that um, it is not something that can be biologically accurately categorized, and yet um, we try to, and we teach about that. So we teach uh, that there are biological connections that you can identify race um, in a way that you can think about ancestry which is not particularly accurate um, because we know that race was constructed um, in a social and political construct, mainly to confirm the institution of slavery and other ways to exploit um, certain populations. So, so what's really complicated about this is that we know that race is a rough and imprecise proxy for a number of other things, including culture, genetics, and socioeconomic status. Um, and yet we use race to confirm assumptions and prejudices and biases about our patients. I find it very difficult when I, when I think about the, the term that race is a social and political construct. Um, to say that race is not something that is biologically categorized and to say that it was a constructed thing almost implies that it's not important or that it doesn't have uh, some sort of salience in our day-to-day -day society. And then that is not what is being said when we say that race is a social and political construct. It has a massive impact on the ways in which we conduct ourselves and move through the world. Um, and just because it is not a biological con construction, just because it's not a biological thing does not mean that it's not an extremely important thing that doesn't have a huge impact on the way that we um, move through the world and interact in the world. So I'd like us to ponder this quote. African-Americans have higher incarceration rates, higher unemployment, lower incomes, lower home and business ownership, less education, less health care, more disease, and lower life expectancy than whites. If you believe blacks are naturally dumb, sick, criminal, you have your answer for these discrepancies. If, however, you resist using stereotypes to make sense of your world, institutional racism provides a very practical and very traceable explanation for the inferior societal position of African-Americans. 
I find this quote to be particularly important because when I think about medicine and I think about psychiatry and I think about uh, the behavioral health world, I often think that when we look at these differences in outcomes um, in health settings, we default to this belief system that blacks are naturally dumb, sick, or criminal. We don't necessarily go beyond trying to understand what is the cause of, of these, this inferior societal position of African Americans. We tend to default into this belief that there's some sort of natural um, difference, some sort of natural intrinsic difference in these populations that leads to these outcomes. And, um, I, and, and I'm, I'm gonna give examples of how we default to that condition as we, as we move forward. So how did we get here? So of course, in 1776, um, these men um, gathered together at the founding of this country to create the Declaration of, of Independence. And um, these men said that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, it's such a great ideal and a standard, and it's the standard upon which this country was founded. The problem, of course, is that this, this belief that all men are created equal, we know, is in fact not the belief system by which this country was founded. And um, this, this famous painting of the signers of the Declaration of Independence kind of shows exactly who were considered to be the men that were created equal. And anybody else that did not fit into that category um, was not given the same advantages, was not given the same rights, um, was not given the same opportunities in this country to be successful. And in fact, were placed into categories into which they were oppressed and marginalized and, and um, given uh, no opportunities to have power. And so on that founding, um, just uh, about 50 years later, um, you saw the rise of Samuel Cartwright, a physician who, um, in the times of, of slavery, was pushing the concept of psychiatric pseudoscience. Um, and he had specific beliefs about certain mental illnesses that he thought that slaves had in those times. One of them was the concept of drapetomania. Um, this was an idea that slaves were um, if, they, if they had this particular illness, they had this um, desire to run away from captivity. Um, and he conceptualized this as a mental illness, um, the, the desire for an enslaved African to try to escape slavery. And, and so one of the things that Cartwright said about this condition, he said, if any one or more of them at any time are inclined to raise their heads to a level with their master or overseer, Humanity and their own good requires that they should be punished until they fall into that submissive state which was intended for them to occupy. They have only to be kept in that state and treated like children to prevent and cure them from running away. And the other condition he described and created was something called dysesthesia ethiopica. And he said that this was a disease of rascality or a disease of laziness that you would often find in enslaved Africans. Um, and, and he said that the disease is the natural offspring of Negro liberty, the liberty to be idle, to wallow in filth, and to indulge in proper food and drinks. After the prescribed course of treatment, the slave will look grateful and thankful to the white man whose compulsory power has restored his sensation and dispelled the mist that clouded his intellect. Um, and what I think is so interesting about uh, both of these conditions is that um, a very specific principle of social injustice was employed by Samuel Cartwright. He was erasing context. He was, he was erasing the context by which he was viewing these conditions and viewing it through a lens um, that was um, steeped in social injustice and oppression. So, so with his um, consideration of dysesthesia ethiopica, he was saying that uh, these slaves were lazy and didn't want to work hard, but there was no context to the fact that slaves um, at that time were high, highly um, 
uh, they're, they're, they were highly cal calorie restricted. So they were often malnourished um, and underfed in order to save money. Um, and as a result of that malnourishment, um, many times um, it was very difficult to work in the extreme um, torturous conditions that slaves were asked to work in. And yet still, even with all of that, slaves um, put out a, an extreme amount of output, an extreme amount of uh, productivity. Um, and yet still, with all of that context, um, Cartwright had a belief that the, the, natural, the natural state of African, um, African people was to be lazy. We actually see that kind of extending into our day-to-day system now in which we often look and, and comment on or imply that um, Black people have some sort of laziness or have some sort of uh, lack of interest in working hard. And then we often say that the, that same reason for the inferior status has to do with um, this rascality. Oh, and I, I just want to point out, um, I'd just like to point out that the treatment that Samuel Cartwright said for both of these conditions, he actually said was whipping. So I, I'd like to highlight the concept of health disparities and, and I'd like to contrast with that with the definition of health inequities. So health disparities are defined as differences in health status among different segments of the population, including differences that occur by gender or race or ethnicity or education or income or disability or where you live. If you notice, there's no mention here when we talk about health disparities as to the cause of these differences in health, just points out that there are differences. So I would like to contrast this with the concept of health inequities because health inequities are disparities in health that are the result of systemic, avoidable, and unjust social and economic policies and practices that create barriers to opportunity. And, and I think that's really important for us to distinguish these things because when we think about the differences in outcomes in health that we see in different populations in the country, those differences, um, if we think about them and, and call them health disparities, as we often do, we're often defaulting to this um, image that people, uh, that, that, that health disparities are the result of some sort of intrinsic difference um, in people, whether that be biological, whether that be cultural, whether that be um, people's general belief system, but that it's more kind of a personal reason or, or there's personal responsibility for the reasons that you see these differences across large populations. Whereas health inequities is saying, the reason you see these differences are because of the systemic avoidable and unjust social and economic policies and practices that create barriers to opportunity. And when I think about all the many um, mental health inequities that we see in our society, um, it's very, very difficult for me to even come up with one that I would define as a disparity. Um, every single difference in mental health outcomes that we see across every population has something to do with the systemic avoidable and unjust social and economic policies and practices that create barriers to opportunity. Um, and, and again, we're, we're primed to think about these things in a way in which we seat the pathology in the individual instead of thinking about the pathology as happening as a result of policies and practices. Perfect example is for instance, that we have, we see higher rates of depression in women compared to men. And um, we could say that could, that must be a health disparity. And I think we, we, we default to thinking about that. And if we think about those higher rates of depression as a disparity, we often then try to seek internal um, explanations for why that difference exists. So one of the common things we do is we say, it has to, it must be, related to hormones. It must be hormone levels, right? Because um, women have estrogen and there must be something about estrogen that leads women to have higher rates of depression. Um, and nowhere in that formulation are we thinking about the fact that women are much more likely to be victims of crimes, to be assaulted, to be traumatized um, than men in our society. Um, and so there is a direct, as we know, there is a very direct connection between depression and trauma and mistreatment and oppression 
Um, and yet we don't conce conceptualize that, <clears throat> excuse me, that that may be one of the main reasons, in fact, that we see these differences in outcomes. Um, we, we default to the idea that it is some sort of biological or some sort of genetic difference rather than um, the society um, and the fact that we exist in, in an extremely patriarchal society and, and that that may be the reason why we see these higher rates of depression. Um, so um, it's important for us to define the concept of the social determinants of mental health. Um, they are the societal, environmental, and economic conditions that impact and affect mental health outcomes across various populations. These conditions are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels, which are themselves influenced by policy choices. But most importantly, the social determinants of health are prominently responsible for health disparities and health inequities seen both within and among populations. And so what that's saying is those differences in outcomes that we see, those differences, whether they be intrinsic differences or whether they be differences that are the result of unfair and unjust social and economic policies and practices, all of those differences um, are really, the social determinants of health are responsible for those differences that we see in health. And so that's a really important concept because again, if it's, if it's not some sort of like intrinsic difference, if it's really the, the factors, the environmental conditions that we um, exist in and, and those conditions that are shaped by the distribution of money and power and resources, then our intervention point becomes very different. Where we are trying to make a difference um, shifts dramatically. Um, and I think we spend a lot of time in psychiatry and in mental health trying to make a difference by prescribing medication, um, doing therapy, um, but we know that these differences are the result of societal um, conditions that are shaped by the distribution of money and power resources. And so we need to think more about changing where our intervention points are. So in thinking about this, um, in, in work that I did with Michael Compton, we, um, we worked on a book several years back called The Social Determinants of Mental Health. And, and in that book, we set about to try to gather all the evidence that exists around what the social determinants are um, and how they impact mental health. So, so we gathered all of that evidence together. And, and as, as I was gathering that evidence, it, it became very clear to me that um, the social determinants are in fact responsible for health inequities and mental health inequities in particular. Um, and then that work kind of evolved for me. Um, and in recently, Sarah Vincent and I published Social Injustice and Mental Health because my, my thinking evolved. Um, so I first started thinking about how we need to intervene at the level of the social determinant. Um, and it wasn't until I started thinking through about social injustice and the role of social injustice that I thought that maybe our intervention points need to be changed. And let me explain this a little bit further. Um, and kind of walk you through my thought process. So this is a conceptualization of the social determinants of mental health as created by myself and Dr. Compton. At the very top of this very busy figure, you see adverse mental health outcomes and mental health inequities. So you see the end result of all of these things. And so as we move down this figure, the first thing that you encounter are risk factors. Um, these are things that precede an illness and increase the likelihood that you will develop an illness. That includes things like reduced options and poor choices, behavioral risk factors, physiological st stress responses, and psychological stress. Uh, if you are intervening at the level of the risk factor, that's, that's how we're taught in mental health. We're taught that if you're wanting to prevent an illness um, from developing, if you're wanting to prevent a mental illness or a substance use disorder, you need to jump in and intervene at the level of the risk factor. Uh, but my work in thinking about the social determinants of mental health has led me to understand that if you're intervening at that level, oftentimes you're intervening too late. This relates to Link and Phelan's work on the fundamental causes of disease. Uh, the context that has set this, the risk factor in motion happened long before the risk factor. And so you have to move further upstream to address the social determinants of mental health if you're going to have any um, bearing on the creation of the risk factor. And so, so then the idea is that all of these things that are in this box, which is not an exhaustive list of all the social determinants of mental health, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's many social determinants of mental health, that all of these things 
create the context and lead to the development of a risk factor that then leads to these poor outcomes and these inequities. So things like adverse early life experiences and discrimination and low education and unemployment and homelessness and housing instability and food insecurity and uh, climate change and adverse features of the built environment, all of these things are the social determinants that then create the context by which the risk factor develops. And so, again, I started thinking I needed to intervene at the level of the social determinant in order to uh, change mental health outcomes. Um, but the work uh, that, that I've been doing with uh, Sarah Vinson and thinking about the social, social injustice has led me to realize that if you're intervening at the level of the social determinant of mental health, you're still intervening too late because there is a context under which or, or further upstream that sets the conditions for the development of those social determinants. And that is social injustice itself or the unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity in our society. And so the unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity then leads to the development of these social determinants that lead to the risk factors that lead to the mental health inequities. And what is underlying all of that social injustice and unfair and unjust distribution of opportunities? Well, it's actually the laws that we pass as a society, um, the policies that we are governed by, and it is the social norms or the attitudes or beliefs that we feel about people. So if we have a belief system in which we think that a certain population is lazy or doesn't work hard or doesn't, um, is not deserving of certain benefits in society, we then create a system of laws that confirms that belief system. And that system and laws then gives advantages to certain populations and disadvantages to the population that we have negative views about. And then those disadvantages um, are manifest by the social determinants of mental health. And then those social determinants of mental health go on to create the risk factors and the poor outcomes that we see. So if we are going to truly make a difference in this cycle, we actually have to start with the, the core belief systems that we have about people and the laws that we pass. And, and I will also point out that that is a bi-directional thing, that the laws that we pass about people can often change the beliefs that we have about, about people. So um, that relates to a lot of com um, complex concepts that, that you've already kind of been, uh, have discussed, including things like the war on drugs and mass incarceration. So let's review a couple of important key concepts. First uh, are the many different types of discrimination. Um, so you can have legal or illegal discrimination. So legal discrimination is, of course, um, obviously things like Jim Crow laws are, are examples of legal discrimination, but legal discrimination is also any discrimination that occurs um, for a group that is not part of a protected class. So you're actually, it's actually okay for you to discriminate against any population that has not been identified legally as part of a protected class. And so again, the policies that we pass in our society determine who is protected and who is not. For example, um, it was only just last year that the Civil Rights Act was expanded to include LGBTQ populations. Um, and so prior to that, you could discriminate against LGBTQ people um, and it was not necessarily uh, illegal for you to do so. Like you could not hire somebody um, at a workplace or you could fire someone at a workplace and that would not necessarily be an illegal act. Um, so, so that would be a form of legal discrimination. And this gets to the, the point of how the laws that we pass in our society, our public policies are really important um, because they dictate what is, what is okay and what is not okay in our society. Um, so of course, most, discrimination is illegal. Most discrimination that takes place against people that are in a protected class or protected status, they, um, which includes um, race and gender and creed um, and sexuality um, and um, gender identity, that these things now are in fact illegal and it is in fact illegal to discriminate against those things. You can have overt or covert racism or discrimination. Overt discrimination is just what it says. It's very obvious that you're experiencing discrimination. It's very clear. Um, and covert discrimination is, is more 
the, the way we talk about microaggressions. It's this idea that it's not particularly clear always whether or not discrimination is occurring and, and you're kind of left scratching your head wondering um, what just happened in that interaction. It takes up a lot of mental energy and strain, covert discrimination. Um, and, then, and then there are levels of discrimination. So you have interpersonal or individual, you have institutional or organizational, and you have structural or systemic. And I, I just want to point out that the interpersonal discrimination is the type of discrimination that gets all of the attention. Um, so whenever you hear kind of a high profile story that, that is in the news or in the media, it's often interpersonal discrimination. One person says something to another person or does something to another person. And, and we get wind of that or it's, it's recorded and then there's kind of a big um, media uproar. Um, and that interpersonal uh, discrimination, of course, is extremely traumatic to the people involved. Um, and it's also traumatic to the people that are watching. Um, but it's actually not the type of discrimination that is so pervasive and problematic in our society. That is actually structural discrimination. So it's not the interpersonal discrimination that's leading to these differences in outcomes that we see. It's actually the structural discrimination. And I'll actually come back to that concept in just a second. So a couple of other principles are uh, essentialism. This is the belief that there are distinct, unchanging, and natural characteristics that define social groups and facilitate their categorization. Essentialism is a big concept in medicine. We, we want to put people into categories. We want to categorize groups. We want to say that this particular group of people does this, and this particular group of people does this. Um, we know that that's not how people work, um, but it doesn't stop us from categorizing people anyway and, and forming opinions and decisions. And again, it's a big way that we're taught in medicine because it helps to identify patterns. It helps us to, to, um, to, to learn pattern recognition, which is important um, when treating certain illnesses. The problem is, of course, that an illness is very different from a human being. Um, and human beings do not necessarily uh, categorize as easily as certain conditions or certain illnesses do. And yet we're taught sometimes to connect um, certain uh, characteristics, including race and gender, um, and other characteristics, we're taught to connect those to certain illnesses and, and um, we're taught the, the concept of essentialism. There's also this concept of erasure of context. This is, um, I mentioned this already in talking about Samuel Cartwright's theories. This is, um, or, or Samuel Cartwright's pseudoscience. Uh, this is a, the failure to consider socio-historical context when seeking to understand the etiology of inequities. So this is when um, you're not understanding uh, what all is going on in the experience of that group, that population, um, that's leading to the development of, of what you're seeing. And I'm going to spend a lot more time on erasure of context in just a second, so we'll come back to that. And then biological determinism is the false belief that racial groups are biologically and genetically different. Again, as I mentioned, this is something that happens in medicine all the time. It happens in psychiatry. Um, we still believe that racial groups are biologically and genetically different, even though we have contrary information from the Human Genome, Genome Project to confirm that that is not, not actually the case and that there's actually more genetic variation um, between races than there is across different racial groups. And then cultural determinism is the false belief that differences in racial groups are the result of cultural factors, which can be just as dangerous. And this idea that certain cultural groups have very particular um, belief systems, very particular ways of being, and that those ways of being are, are completely different from, from other groups and other factors, and they lead to differences in, um, in outcomes that we see. Structural racism is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, and cultural representations and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. And it is a system that identifies dimensions of our history and culture that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color to endure and adapt over time. And it is not something that a few people or institutions choose to practice. Instead, it's been a feature 
of the social, economic, and political systems in which we all exist. And importantly, it does not require the actions or the intentions of others. So if we were to get rid of all the interpersonal discrimination that exists in the world today, we would still in fact see racial and ethnic inequities in our society, health inequities and all the other inequities that we see because of the persistence of structural risks. So let's now shift and talk a little bit about social injustice in psychiatry in particular. So there are many ways that you see this uh, reflected and see uh, structural racism impacting health. Um, one I mentioned in passing was of course the war on drugs. And this particularly is where you see this intersection of social norms and public policies in the creation of our laws and how that creates this unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity. So you can see it in the ways that we think about people um, in the early 1980s who were using crack cocaine and the way we think about people in the current day who, who use opioids. And the fact that um, the majority of people who use crack cocaine were African-American and the majority of people who use opioids are white. Um, and we have conceptualized the crack cocaine epidemic as a criminal epidemic, and we um, felt that the need, the, the 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 proper intervention for for that has to be um, incarceration, and that led to the mass incarceration of many African Americans in this country. Um, whereas the current opioid epidemic is clearly considered to be a public health crisis, um, and it is um, treated as such, and the laws that we pass reflect that value system that we have created on these things. So the war on drugs. And the mass incarceration that 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 was the result of the war on drugs is very much a result of social uh, of, of social injustice and structural racism. Residential segregation is actually kind of the foundational um, social uh, injustice. It's a foundational example of structural racism um, because this concept of redlining that led to um, uh, pushing. Um, certain communities uh, into uh, certain people into certain communities and saying that those communities um, were not worthy of investment. And then this disinvestment in these communities. What you end up seeing now is, a, is, is the result of all of those ways, um, including racial covenants that kept certain populations um, in, in communities that were thriving and that had all social services, um, relegated other communities, communities of color, to not having any of those of those services. You actually see it as it relates to health because it has a lot to do with where clinics are located. It has a lot to do with where health systems are located. So access becomes a very huge issue of, of residential segregation. Um, because if you don't live in a community, just, just as we know it's related to food insecurity as well, if you don't live in a community where you can access these things, that is going to leave these benefits, these advantages, you're, you're going to have poorer outcomes. We actually see this now when we think about COVID, um, because we, we we saw recent data uh, that NPR just put out that shows that COVID vaccination centers, areas where people can get vaccine, um, is much less in communities of color. It is harder to access places to get vaccine in communities of color uh, compared to white communities, meaning that um, white people can um, easily or more quickly get to a center that is giving vaccine than um, people of black uh, or indigenous or Latinx um, backgrounds. Um, what's interesting about that is that the narrative, again, this default that we often have to this idea of health disparities, right? So, so we say, okay, um, there is a difference in who is getting vaccinated in this country. And what is the main explanation that we have for why that is? Vaccine hesitancy, distrust. We say African-Americans don't trust the vaccine. Um, and I'm not trying to say that there's not an element of play there, but it's funny that we often default to that instead of looking at where, where is the access? How easy is it for people to get vaccines? So, so many, many of, much of the time um, we, we are moving back into seeding the pathology in the individual instead of looking at the structural reasons for why we don't see these, these same, same outcomes. And then immigration policy is a really common example of structural racism. Um, 
we, we see quotas and, and a system in place about who can come into this country. Um, we are very particular about which countries are allowed to come in freely and which countries um, we are more restrictive about who comes from those countries. Um, we also, uh, as it relates to health, our immigration policies are extremely um, focused on screening out people who have serious mental illness or substance use disorders. So if you have a serious mental illness or substance use disorders, you cannot, you cannot immigrate into the United States. Um, you, would, you would not be granted uh, uh, immigration um, uh, uh, status to come to the United States. What that means is that we end up having a population here in the United States of immigrants that are healthier than the population um, that is, is kind of consistent with uh, the rest of the country, the native, the native uh, population of the United States, um, or the citizens of the United States is probably the better way to say that. So what happens is um, you see these differences in outcomes. You see um, higher rates of substance use disorder, higher rates of, of, um, of uh, mental illness in this particular population. And we, we, we have these theories about the healthy immigrant effect and all of that, but we don't necessarily look at the policies that have created the healthy immigrant um, that were specifically the laws that we passed in our society. The Social Security Act of 1935, this is um, the act that created retirement benefits um, for people. Um, if you remember, this is, uh, this is basically our medi our medi part of our Medicare uh, system um, in which you pay into or you pay into the Social Security system um, throughout your life as you work. And then when you reach retirement age, you get um, a retirement benefit in the form of, of financial security. This was a wonderful act because prior to the Social Security Act, older adults um, did not have the means, did not have the financial security to retire. Um, and if they did retire, it was very difficult for them um, from a financial perspective. It would be um, a lot of financial stress, a lot of anxiety around money and an inability to pass wealth on to their, their children. So often older adults were a burden to their family. Um, in, the, in their retirement age. So this act became very um, important and allowed people to pass wealth on to their children and to their grandchildren. It, it, it was a mechanism by which people could build wealth. The problem with the Social Security Act of 1935 was in order to get it passed, um, Southern senators said that they needed it to exclude agricultural and domestic workers. And at that time, African Americans were the majority of agricultural and domestic workers in the South. Um, and so all agricultural and domestic workers, even though they worked as hard as everybody else, were excluded from the ability to pay into this system and get a, and get to an age where when they retire, they get some money um, back to them. Um, and so as a result, those particular people were not allowed to retire in, um, and and have less strain, less stress, and, and live healthier adult, uh, older adult lives. Um, they were not able to pass wealth along to um, their, the next generation. And, and you can see the, the development of the wealth gap in this country along racial lines as a result of um, policies like the Social Security Act. And then um, the mental health care system, um, uh, Dr. Vincent talked about this already, so I'm not going to go into it, but it has a lot, again, to do with access to care and the fact that um, most Black and Latin ex people with mental health problems do not access mental health services. And the overwhelming majority of Black and Latin ex people with substance use disorders, we're talking in the, the high 80s to 90%, um, of people, of Black and Latinx people who have substance use disorders do not access substance use services. And our default thought is that Black people and Latinx people have more stigma towards the mental health care system, or maybe they have less insight. But the truth is um, that the data shows that the reason um, that you see these differences is because of cost, because it is too expensive to pay for mental health services, to pay for substance use services, and there's no access to these services. And so again, a structural issue is creating these disparities and inequities that we see. Um, and it is not necessarily um, uh, all due to personal choice or personal decisions that these populations make. 
So let's talk a little bit about schizophrenia. So prior to the 1960s, psychiatrists um, looked at um, a, a population at Ionia State Hospital in Michigan. And this is work that was done by Jonathan Metzl in his um, groundbreaking book, The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease. He poured through the records of Ionia State Hospital. And he found um, that in the early 50s and 60s, um, what the, the majority of people that were being admitted to this state hospital were white, white women. Um, and they were being admitted for, for, psych for psychosis, for diagnoses of psychosis. And some of the assessments um, of their conditions included things like, wasn't able to take care of her family as she should, can't do her housework, talked too loudly and embarrassed her husband. And that, those were the reasons why she was hospitalized um, at the state hospital and diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so the way that Metzl conceptualizes this, he says, perhaps she rebelled against a patriarchal system and a patriarchal diagnosis that allowed white male doctors and her white male husband to be the arbiters of her mental health. However, the most important aspect is that her defiance was, was interpreted as a symptom, but not as a threat. And I think that's so clear. You see this ad, um, and it wasn't for an antipsychotic, it was for a benzo, but it was still this idea that these poor women um, who are just laboring out of control and, and um, having a lot of problems with anxiety, um, trying to keep up with their, their household responsibilities and duties. So at that time, the common conceptualizations of schizophrenia did not include any symptoms of paranoia or aggression or hostility. Instead, schizophrenia was conceptualized as a disease resulting from early life psychological trauma, often committed at the hands of a schizophrenogenic mother. So it was mostly white women that were being diagnosed with schizophrenia, and then it was the fault of their mothers why they were developing these, these conditions as well. And it wasn't until the mid 60s that you started to see the rise in this concept of the protest psychosis. And the protest psychosis is a particular type of reactive psychosis um, that, that Bromberg and uh, Simon described in an Archives of General Psychiatry article at the time. So they, they coined this uh, reactive psychosis arising in Black males as a result of the stress of asserting civil rights in the United States. They likened the symptoms of schizophrenia, but they also described hallucinations of African beings, adoption of, Isl uh, of Islamic doctrine, and promotion of anti-white mindsets. So researchers claimed that black psychiatric patients had higher measures of hostility than white psychiatric patients stemming from delusional beliefs that their civil rights were being compromised or violated. And so you started to see um, at this time a large scale pathologizing of the tenets of the civil rights movement. And so by equating these ideas with paranoid delusions, it allowed certain sectors of society a mechanism for marginalizing and removing threats to the status quo, people that were protesting um, against their civil rights. It was a mechanism for removing those threats in the name of safety and mental health. Um, it, it, it's particularly interesting at a time where we are actually seeing a rise in protests over civil rights um, to see if, if we'll, we'll see any sort of uh, correlations here. Um, but what, what happened is um, there beca began to be this very clear collect, uh, connection as a result of this protest psychosis description between Black men and this idea that they were aggressive and assaultive and belligerent and hostile. Um, and you see that with these ads. Um, and then you started to see a change in psychiatrists prescribing. Um, these ads were very effective. Um, we are, uh, psychiatrists are very um, swayable by, by advertising, which is why it, why it works and why so much money is spent on it. So an ad like this one led to people prescribing uh, first-generation antipsychotics at much higher rates to African-Americans and African-American men um, compared to white populations. And, and I will just say that there's a number of reasons. There's, there's many, many reasons for why we, we choose to prescribe a first-generation antipsychotic versus a second-generation antipsychotic. 
In fact, I was often taught, um, you know, there, there's a cost situation here. You want to make sure people can pay for their medications. So, you know, first generation antipsychotics are cheaper. So you should put people on on those if, if there's a chance that they might not be able to afford their medication. Um, uh, which again, there's there's so much um, there's so much interaction here. There's so many complexities about what what we think because who do we decide is poor and who who can we determine can pay for their medication and who cannot and how do we make those decisions? Do we talk to the patient specifically about that? Um, because what I found is, is that my own personal experience is very consistent with the data that shows that um, Black people are more likely to be diagnosed um, and more likely to be prescribed first-generation antipsychotics. So what you see now, this is older data and newer data that shows that African Americans are more likely to be diagnosed with a, a psychotic disorder, with a primary psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, than they are with an affective disorder like bipolar disorder. Again, this study has been replicated, still happening, um, but back in the 80s and the 90s, black men were diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia at a rate that was five to seven times that of white men. And today, um, you know, we like to think that this is something that happened in the 60s and that we've moved on from that. Um, but today, black patients are more likely to be uh, hospitalized involuntarily, administered higher doses of antipsychotics, administered medications against their will, and secluded and restrained than white patients. So, in the time that I have left, let's talk about some possible solutions. So, um, I, I think that uh, Dr. Vincent showed you all this picture as well. Um, this is where we are and where we need to go. So currently we're in a state of inequality. Um, people have unequal access to opportunities. Some people get advantages, some people have disadvantages, some people have more advantages, some people have less advantages, but we're in a pretty clear state of inequality. The goal, some people think the goal is equality, evenly distributing tools and assistance to others. This is not the goal. Um, again, some people get focused on this as the goal because they say we have to, whatever we do, it has to be fair. We have to make sure that everybody gets the same um, tools, everybody gets the same assistance. If we provide special treatment to certain populations, that will be very problematic. So many people think that the goal is equality, but as you can see, if you're focused on fairness, um, you're missing the point. Um, so one of the goals has to be equity. And it has to be making sure that people get custom tools to identify and address inequalities. Um, and so, um, as you can see with this figure, if you give somebody the tool that works for them, you're not necessarily um, doing the fair thing, but you're doing the thing that allows them to be more to be more equitable, allows for a more equitable outcome. And finally, equity itself is not enough. It's not enough of a goal we have to think about justice as well. And justice is when you're actually trying to address the structural inequities. So it is fixing the system to offer equal access to both tools and opportunities. So equity and justice have to be combined and we have to think about those things together. So ways that we can do that include education and self-reflection, promoting social norms of inclusion, equity, and respect, advocating for equitable public policies, and finally speaking up and taking a stand. So education and self-reflection, because we are not taught these things in health professional schools, this requires us to do a fair amount of work on our own to understand these concepts. Um, and it's, it's just as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we're socialized from the very beginning of childhood not to talk about these issues, and as a result, None of this is taught in our school systems. Um, maybe if you took a class on critical race theory in college, you, you understand some of this. Um, but most people did not get, get those courses. Um, and then you, you got to medical school or you got to um, graduate school or any number of other schools, and, and there was not necessarily a focus on structural racism and how it impacts health. So the work 
has to be done um, to understand the rich history and the immense amount of scholarship that exists in this area. And so um, anybody who's committed to making change and to improving the situation has to do this work. Has to, and, and I, I wish there was a way around this. I wish I could say, oh, you can just you know watch a movie and you'll be okay. Um, but but you really have to do this preliminary work to fully understand these concepts. And so here are some books to get you started. Um, and I said, you know, it's not that easy, but actually it is a little bit easy. If you want to just like test the waters, there are some um, really great podcasts and um, they can kind of introduce you to these concepts in a way. It's not gonna be like the extent of what your knowledge is that you need, but they can at least introduce you to some of these concepts. So some of them include the 1619 Project and Seeing White and Code Switch and Reveal. And then I just put three books um, that are easier to read than the, the books on the previous page. Um, so if you want um, an introduction that's just, I think a little bit more user-friendly in terms of like, um, an entry point. I think these books, uh, Mediocre and How to Be Anti-Racist and White Fragility, these are books that are much more accessible and much easier to read. And then, of course, the documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, which is now on Netflix, um, is a really good way to understand the history of race in this country. And, and James Baldwin has always been able to give really great perspectives on um on on that history and and so this documentary is is kind of told through his his work and his words the other thing we have to do is practice cultural humility um, and cultural humility is a concept created by melanie turvalon and jan marie garcia um, and i i have the pleasure that i get to work with jan marie garcia on a pretty regular basis here at uc davis um, but it involves three main tenants. The first is, I think, the most important and the piece that we all have to come to terms with, which is that if you're going to practice cultural humility, you have to commit to a lifelong process of self-evaluation and self-critique. Um, it, it would be wonderful if you could just read those books and you were done, um, or you could just watch that podcast and you were done. But actually, this is work that all of us have to do for the rest of our lives. Um, it is constantly evaluating, critiquing. It is work that I have to do to my, with myself on a daily basis. I have to reflect and I have to think about um, my role, my bias, um, power, and I have to think about all of these structures on a day-to-day -day basis. And so anybody that wants to do this work has to also commit to that lifelong process. And then very importantly, it, cultural humility involves a desire to fix power imbalances between prior providers and, and clients. We don't spend enough time focusing on this, but it's really, really critical that we um, notice and identify when we've created power imbalances. We've structured this into the system. We've created a system in which we oppress our patients and we make it difficult for them um, to, to receive services. Um, often they're discriminated against when they try to receive ser services. So we actually need to try to address that and fix that and fix those power imbalances that we've naturally created within our system. And finally, we need to work with our community partnerships um, to advocate within the larger organizations in which we participate. And then the other concept that we have to um, think about is structural competence. This is work by Jonathan Metzl and Helena Hansen. It, it's defined as the trained ability to discern how a host of issues defined clinically as symptoms, attitudes, or diseases also represent the downstream implications of a number of upstream decisions about such matters as healthcare and food and zoning, or even the very definitions of illness and health. So, you know, we spend we spend time thinking about cultural competence, and that is an important foundation. But we have to move beyond that to cultural humility. And then we have to move to structural competence where we're looking at the systems and how the systems and the structures have created the outcomes that we see, not necessarily the individual. And then once we have structural competence, we can move on to structural humility. But ultimately, we have to work on the laws that we pass in our society and the attitudes and beliefs that we have about each other. And so if we're going to make inter interventions there, we have to promote social norms of inclusion, equity, and respect. And here's just one more James Baldwin quote because he always says the right, always said the right thing. 
we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. And so when we think about social norms um, and we think about promoting social norms of inclusion, equity, and respect, many times we spend a lot of time protecting the person who's violating those social norms. We spend a lot of time um, trying to um, make sure that that person doesn't lose their power, doesn't lose their stature. And that's the wrong way to go about doing things, especially if that person is um, taking away someone's um, uh, right to exist. Uh, so we have to, as a society, enforce social norms of inclusion and equity. Um, and, and we have to be really particular about this. I, I think that when someone violates these social norms of inclusion and equity, when somebody um, makes someone feel excluded or makes someone feel less than, we have to, we have to speak up and we have to um, hold that person accountable. And there's ways that you can do that. Um, you can educate or legislate. So, so many people say things um, out of ignorance. Many people have beliefs about certain populations um, because they um, don't know any better. Um, and so in those situations, I think it's important to educate people. Um, and, and those people can, that are educated often take that information and grow and learn. Um, but there is a subset of the population that it doesn't matter how much you educate them, they will never grow and they will never learn. And so for that population, I would say you have to legislate. You have to use the laws that exist in society to prevent those people from harming others. You have to do work in which you're uh, observing and challenging your own implicit biases. This is work I do on a daily basis. The, once you start to identify your implicit biases, once you start to get good at identifying them, you start to notice them all the time. And so what I find is that I have thoughts that are inconsistent with my values um, and my value system probably on a daily basis. Um, and because I'm getting better at identifying and noticing these things, I see them and I experience them more often. So. The idea is not to beat yourself up if your thoughts are not consistent with your values, but it's to identify them and challenge them and also make sure that they don't get in the way of your decision making, um, especially when you're interacting with patients. And of course, as we mentioned before, evaluating and breaking down unnecessary, unnecessary hierarchies. And so then if we're going to advocate for public policies, um, we have to understand that all policies are health policies and that we have to move beyond the walls of our clinics and our hospitals and our treatment centers to advocate for policies that address the social determinants of mental health. We need to have relationships with our elected officials and we need to help promote equitable representation for our communities. And we need to form cross-sector collaborations and community coalitions. So political stances and policy interventions are required to remain apolitical, which is something we often do in mental health, to remain apolitical or neutral is a political stance because it is a tacit acceptance of the status quo. And so finally, I will end with these two quotes that inspire me to do the final thing that we have to do, which is to speak up and take a stand. And so Congressman John Lewis said that if you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. And Audre Lorde, who I think actually today is Audre Lorde's birthday, um, said that when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed, but when we are silent, we are still afraid, so it is better to speak. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Shim. Um, I want to take a moment just to maybe do a silent round of applause for everybody that's on the call. Um, thank you so much for your talk today. So I wanna I wanna know if there are any questions and if anybody has questions, please feel free to uh, enter them into the chat. Um, I think that the purpose of us having these talks and and Dr. Shim, you are the fourth presenter that we've had this year in the in a series of talks in that sort of increasing our awareness about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also helping us to sort of uh, center our efforts. Um, so we thank you for that. And the purpose of the talks has been to kind of highlight uh, for our department all of the different ways in which we, we can each individually engage. And so I really appreciate the quotes that you had at the end, because I think it's really, really important for us to feel empowered, because sometimes these issues and problems can feel so overwhelming. 
So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Any questions? There's a lot of things in the chat already. Um, so there's a question here from Dr. Spaderner. Did the ACA's expansion of Medicaid do anything to reduce racial disparities in health? That's a great question. Um, yes, um, and I noticed you used uh, disparities um, when we we're talking about an inequity. It is an it is an inequity. So so the lack of um, insurance coverage is a is a health inequity, um, and it did a lot. It didn't. It, it did a lot. So. We went from, um, um, I can't, I don't, I'm really bad with numbers. So, but I will say that there was a significant reduction in the number of uninsured people in this country. However, what you see is that, and this relates very clearly, if you think about the Social Security Act and you think about what happened with Medicaid expansion under the ACA, there were certain states that chose not to expand Medicaid. And it just so happens that most of those states happen to be southern states. Um, they happen to be states that are um, um, mostly uh, Republican controlled states. Um, and, and so, uh, even though there are many Republican controlled states that did expand Medicaid, but, but many of those states that did not are in the south. Um, and what you see there is that for those states that did not expand Medicaid, you see a widening of health inequities in those in those states. So you see a greater um, amount of lack of access, you see poor outcomes. And so all of these um, widening gaps in the inequities that we're starting to see occur, um, you see you see generally the health of people, the health of people of color in Southern states is, is very poor. Um, and that is a direct result of the lack of Medicaid expansion. So it's it's actually a great question because it's another example of structural racism um, and how it directly impacts health. Oh, that actually, I just wanna add one more thing to that. That gets to a really important point. And um, I, I can't explain it as well as it's explained in the 1619 podcast. But the lack of universal health care, the lack of insurance that we have for everybody in the country is also an issue of structural racism. It's also the whole reason. Um, and again, I really encourage people, I think it's episode four of the 1619 podcast. The AMA was, was vigorously against the idea of expanding health care to make sure that everybody had access. And, and so for us now to be um, one of the only high income countries, I think the only high income country in the world that does not have some sort of universal or um, access to health care is the direct result of systemic racism and structural racism. Um, and it's not necessarily because um, we're just, uh, it's so strongly in, in belief of, of employer insurance or all of that, but it has, it has everything to do with our, our feelings about um, race in this country and our feelings about who is deserving of the advantage of health insurance and who is not. Uh, oh, I see, I see somebody added some really wonderful data. Thank you. Numbers are so great. Mm -hmm. So we have 11.5% of uninsured blacks versus 7.5% of uninsured whites as of 2018. Um, as of, despite the ACA. And I, I would say that that number has come down significantly. So the ACA did a lot to help increase the amount of insurance, but it kept that wide, it kept that gap um, widened for people that were uninsured. Other questions? I believe this record, this is going to be recorded and shared uh, on our website. So for anybody who's asking about that. Yeah, uh, yeah they were recorded. It will be recorded. And I've just uh, put in a link to the 1619 podcast for those who uh, may want to or interested in uh, listening to it. Other questions for Dr. Shim or comments? Very quiet. Quiet response. Uh, so we have a question here. 
Uh, thank you for this lecture, so important. Based on your research and experience, do you believe that there are still diagnostic differences in whites versus uh, BIPOC with similar symptoms, uh, symptoms similar to what was seen with higher incidences of diagnosis in schizophrenia during the civil rights era? Uh, if so, what have you noticed? So are there still diagnostic differences um, in folks with yeah. similar symptoms? I, I, yes. Yeah, so the data, the data shows that. And I, I think that, um, yes, there's still, we are still over diagnosing black people with schizophrenia and under diagnosing bipolar disorder and other mood disorders in black people. Um, that, that persists to this day. Um, but what I think is really interesting about this is that that's not the only diagnosis that we're, um, we're doing this with. Um, I think that there are many other conditions. And, and it gets really tricky when you look at, I'm not a child psychiatrist, but when you look at child psychiatry, you see this a lot. So you see uh, conditions such as oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. And there are huge dis, uh, inequities. There are huge inequities with who gets diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and who gets diagnosed with conduct disorder. Um, and there are many people that, um, strongly discuss how all of these conditions are really um, just a manifestation of complex PTSD. Um, but we don't have complex PTSD in our DSM. And we don't have the, the, the what, what happens um, as a result of repeated traumas, the behavioral manifestations of repeated persistent trauma in, ch in children. Um, so that is defined um, and is, is very clearly identified as complex PTSD. PTSD that's listed in the ICD-9, I'm sorry, the ICD-10, it is not in the DSM. Um, and so as a result, we cannot even diagnose a condition in which most children exist, which is that they are in a situation where they're experiencing multiple traumas. And because they're children, they don't have agency to remove themselves from a traumatic situation. The traumatic situation, by the way, Again, the way we frame this, many times we say that the traumatic situation is they have these parents that don't care about them and treat them horribly. But really what's usually happening is that the traumatic situation is they live in a residentially segregated area in which um, there has been massive disinvestment um, in that population. And, and there are, um, as a result, um, lower employment in, the, in those um, neighborhoods, and um, less access to healthy foods and less, less access to all things health. And as a result of that, um, there is higher rates of violence, higher rates of trauma um, in, the, in those communities. Um, and then a child is kind of stuck and can't leave that. And so they experience multiple traumas. And so those multiple traumas then um, add up. And then children often express that by being oppositional, by being defiant, um, by having maladaptive externalizing behaviors. And so then we diagnose the conduct disorder, we diagnose the end result, but we really don't diagnose the thing that, that kind of was the, the, the main issue. So I would just say that's an example, and it's not even the area that I'm, I'm like, I have particular expertise about, but I would say it's actually an incumbent upon all of us to look at the ways that we are thinking about these conditions, the ways that we're thinking about how we diagnose things and, and examine in ourselves, what are, how, are we, how are we perpetuating this? How are we doing the same thing that these experts were doing back in 1960 um, and in the 1960s? And how are, how are we um, confirming this? And, and you know, how are we as well-meaning providers replicating this pattern. So I think that's the, the lesson for us is we have to we have to look within and see how how we're how we're framing issues. If we're providing context or not. Are we providing context when we talk about these issues or are we are we missing that because it's not our personal experiences? Absolutely. There's a there's a couple other um, just sort of comments that sort of uh, echo what you're saying, Dr. Shim. Um, about African American children being diagnosed later um, uh, with autism, later than white peers, and more likely to have the oppositional defiant disorder diagnosis um, before autism is considered. 
There's a recommendation of the book, uh, post slave sin post traumatic slave syndrome. Um, and also a link. I don't know what this is the ACEs connection. Uh, ACE resilience scores. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I, 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 sorry, you can, um, please, I, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say the ACEs. Um, this is really great because our ACE scores, you know, the original ACE study was done um, in a, in an upper middle class um, majority white population. Um, and it had 10 adverse childhood experiences, but what we know is that it did not cover the breadth of adverse childhood experiences that children experience and particularly it left out adverse childhood experiences that that children of color are more are more likely to uh, experience. So when we even when we think about ACEs, which is a really great way to measure child trauma and track child trauma, even when we think about that, the tools that we're using, I mean, we have to we have to interrogate everything. So we have to even interrogate the tools that we use and say, are these the right tools? So, you know, the, the Philadelphia ACE study expanded the ACEs to include things like being in foster care, um, experiencing racism, um, experiencing bullying. And so, yes, thank you. Um, we have these modified ACEs mm -hmm. that Paso Lucci um, added, so, so thank you. Um, and, and so we, we see this over and over again. We we have to it, we have to interrogate everything, um, and it it requires us to kind of constantly be saying. It, it requires us to be to be really anti-racist. It requires us to say, um, "Is are we are we are we doing what we're doing because it is how we've always done things." Or are we doing this? Um, is this the right way to go about um, changing the system so that we are actually um, operating in an anti racist manner? So, Dr. Shim, you're following Dr. Kendi, who was here yesterday um, and was, was having a conversation through, with. Um, uh, Dr. Gerald with the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And one of the things that he uh, stressed in that talk yesterday was about how we define racism when people are saying, I'm not racist, or they're having some sort of negative uh, reaction to the use of that word. Do you have any guidance for how people should think about defining what racism actually is? Yeah, yeah. you know, I love the way Ibram Kendi, uh, Kendi thinks about this. Because he really does, um, I think, take a lot of the emotional valence out of the idea of racism. Because again, it's an emotionally highly valent topic, and and nobody wants to be accused of being racist. <laughs> and so and so, what what Ibram Kendi um, talks about is if you're trying to be anti-racist, you're you're you can be racist or anti-racist in every single moment. Every moment and every 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 interaction that you have is an opportunity to either take a racist stance or an anti-racist stance. And so it helps me to know that it's not like you're just all 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 either racist or all really not racist, but like we are a collection, we are all collections of racist and, uh, and anti-racist behaviors and actions that we have had. And so it's I think it's helpful there because first of all, you cannot spend any time in this country, um, especially if you've spent any time growing up in this country, but you cannot spend any time in this country. And in fact, many people who come to this country, who immigrate to this country also um, experience this. Um, you, you, you cannot spend time in this country and not walk away with racist beliefs. That's impossible. It's impossible. You can be the the, the greatest person in the, in the world, um, and and it's it's not even um, it's not even just white people. Again, it's it's people of all backgrounds, including black people. Um, but but it's very impossible to not harbor some biased and racial beliefs um, because of the constant messaging that we get in our society. Um, and so 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 the work is not. I'm a bad person. I'm a racist person. I mean, I'm not a racist person. I don't have a racist bone in my body. That's not the work. The work is in this moment. What am I doing? 
to either advance uh, to advance uh, an anti-racist philosophy or what am I doing that's advancing, even if it's not my intention, a racist philosophy and to be kind of moment to moment making these decisions. And I can think back on many, many, many times where I've done, I've had racist actions. Um, and, and the thought is you take that, you learn from it and you move um, forward. And I know that I will continue I will continue to have racist acts. I, I will continue to do that. And, and I hope that I will continue to get better and better at not doing that, but that's the lifelong commitment that you make if you're a cultural humility um, as, ascriber, that it's a lifelong commitment. Uh, we have another question here. Any thoughts on how the Cures Act fits into this topic? How might making clinical notes available to patients impact the trust that they have in uh, providers? So I think that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I so it's it's challenging because um, because it's multiple, it's multi layered, and and so what I'm what I'm always trying to convince people to do is is move away as best they can from thinking interpersonally. And on one on one and to be thinking more structural. So, um, <clears throat> this particular question about clinical notes is an interpersonal question and and it's not to say that interpersonal stuff is not important. Um, but I absolutely think that this, uh, the cures act um, is extremely important. For starting to break down um, patterns of oppression that we use in mental health. So. When we think about people that have serious mental illness and substance use disorders, we tend to oppress these populations. We tend to assume that they lack a certain, we have social norms about this population, that they lack a certain um, insight, that they, they aren't capable of making reasonable decisions for themselves. And there are ways that their illnesses do impact their insight. But, but oftentimes we have operated in psychiatry with this extremely paternalistic view that they are incapable of making decisions for themselves or incapable of thinking things through. And so if you have to write down in a note that your patient sees all of your beliefs, it will at least stop you, at least stop you from kind of making all of those negative assumptions that you kind of naturally do um, to know that you have some oversight, I think, helps um, interfere with that process. So, so I think the oversight process, this, this idea that the, the patient is not some kind of far away person that we're not supposed to, you know, actually like show our true hand to, you know, we're supposed to kind of like come up with our assessment and kind of like speak about them to other people and to students and, and not necessarily, um, you know, engage them in a shared decision making process. I think that the Cures Act really works to move us into this shared decision making place. So I think it's good because it gives it gives power to a population that is consistently powerless, um, and it allows a, a small minor correction um, of that lack of power. But it is one small minor kind of con con correction and it's a good starting place, but it, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in this space. Absolutely. Any other thoughts or comments for Dr. Shin? Anik, I wonder if I could jump in for a second. Sure. Uh, Dr. Shin, I'm Jill Rockbizel. I'm the chair of the department and I want to give you a giant thank you for your talk. There, if you look in the chat, there's many, many, many thank yous, and I just want to say that out loud. Um, this has been an, um, extremely thought provoking. Um, I appreciate your your openness, your directness. Um, as as you may know from talking to Dr. Forrester, we've really been on a mission in our department to tackle this. And I loved your opening when you said, uh, you know, bag the guilt, forget the, and let's get down to the work of we're all responsible, we're all accountable. Uh, for fixing this, for working on this issue. I also appreciate that this is a, a lifelong effort, that none of this is gonna get better overnight and watching a video or reading a book is not gonna fix things. Um, but um, the, your discussion of um, 
cultural humility. Uh, again, I think you can hear that on so many levels. Cultural humility, as far as doing inter, you know, self review and critique, but also in whatever role someone is in, um, uh, any leadership role that critique should include in my role as a leader, am I doing what I need to do? So, uh, you yeah, know, just fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and and you sort of energized me personally to keep this mission going forward. Um, so thank you. Thank you, and I I really appreciate your your comments. It's it's very clear you thought a lot about this. So I think that that's I I actually didn't talk about this, but like leadership, um, who really has spent time thinking about these issues and how to operationalize it is critical. Is absolutely critical. So, so I very much appreciate you sharing that. I will, if there aren't any other questions, I want to echo again, Dr. Shim. Thank you so much for coming today. I think that ultimately we are trying uh, as a as a collective uh, to move this conversation forward and to really uh, continue the work and the the work of self examination as well as uh, examination of what we're doing as a group because it really affects so many things uh, in terms of our society, how we treat patients, um, and sort of how we exist here. So thank you so much again for coming um, on behalf of everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.